I had the coolest job that any electrical engineer could ever have on the ground crew for Solar Impulse 2, the first solar powered airplane to fly around the world only using the power of the sun. IEEE USA has given me a competitive edge because of their support system. It is so much easier doing something and being out of your comfort zone when you have someone there saying, you got this. IEEE USA is more than just a network, it's a family. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for tuning in to today's IEEE USA live stream webinar, Critical Thinking Skills for Engineers, Problem Solving, presented by Sritha Ramanathan. This webinar is the third in our Critical Thinking Skills for Engineers webinar series based on the popular IEEE USA ebook series of the same title and authored by Sritha, the links to which will be provided on the screen as well as sent to each registrant today after the live stream webinar con uh, concludes. I'm your host, Jonathan Cho. IEEE USA's goal is to create programming that is valuable, relevant, and of interest to you. We'll be sending a short survey to all registrants after this event and would love your feedback. We value your opinions and would appreciate it if you could take a few minutes and share your thoughts. Our presenter, Sarita, has 30 years of experience in technology companies, from startups to blue chip firms. As co-founder of Eventi Group, a product marketing agency, he's been instrumental in leading many tech firms through high growth phases. Prior to Eventi Group, Sarita was a marketing executive for Hewlett Packard's managed services business, where he was responsible for marketing worldwide and managing the portfolio of HP managed services, $1.1 billion unit. He's also active in nonprofit work, including being an executive mentor for social entrepreneurs in Santa Clara University's Miller Center. Without further ado, I will now pass it off to our presenter. Welcome back, Sarita. We're very excited to see what you have in store for our audience today. Great to see you, Jonathan, as always. Thank you so much. And it's wonderful to be here once again. Thank you so much, Jonathan, and the IEEE family. I like the term family because we really are a family. You know, I go back to IEEE all the way in my undergraduate days at UC Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley in engineering physics. And I very much still consider myself kind of an engineering mentality. So today we're gonna jump right into one of the key topics of engineering, which has to do with problem solving. And a lot of people, myself included, got into the engineering field, we were attracted to engineering, right, Jonathan? Because it's all about solving problems, problems that people may not even realize is a problem, but could be a problem. So to me, problem solving is what engineering is all about. And this is a quote here from the CEO of Harman International. It says, that's what we're constantly on the lookout for, is a, you know, a better way to do things. So that is the focus of today's topic is problem solving. And per my ebook, uh, we're going to cover eight specific topics and feel free to ask questions, but let's hold it to the very end. And we have a little bit of audience participation for all of you IEEE members out there today who's joining in. And we're going to cover these eight specific points around how to think about problem solving. And I know all of you are engineers and all of you already have a methodology and approach to problem solving. Hopefully, I'll give you a few ideas that you've been able to take back to your desk and begin to use it right away. So let's start with the first important principle, and that is you know, for problem solving, really defining the problem statement is critical. What is the problem that we're trying to solve? And you can see here, Charles Kettering, he was with General Motors. Uh, he was really legendary because he was head of research and he was just an amazing engineer. And he was very good at, at stating problems that are solvable or that frame um, a problem that could be solved very well with engineering. So. Also Einstein, he said, you know, the problem statement is so important that he would rather spend 55 minutes out of an hour thinking about the problem before he even gets to solutions. Very, very telling, right? So because if you, pray, if you frame a problem statement correctly, a lot of times the answers are gonna be much more readily found and, and address the specific problem you're trying to solve. So what I'd like to do is give you some tips on how to frame a problem statement. And there are some steps here, and I'll give you a real example in just a minute of, of how we might apply this. So with a problem statement, the first thing is setting the context. Like, what are we talking about? What is the field? What's the background? What's the environment in which we are examining a particular problem? And then also just describe, well, what is the current situation? What, what is the exact current situation that this problem 
uh, presents itself and why is that even worth solving? Who, who's it affecting? How is it impacting people? That's step number three is what is the impact of this problem? Is it even worth solving? If it's a minor irritant, okay, fine. But if it's a major issue or potentially something that's breakthrough, then um, that could be very well worth solving. Number four is to give you some sort of pointers on what would an ideal state look like? So if we solve this problem, what would the world look like? Or what would this particular area look like if this problem was taken off the table, for example? And then number five is give some hints around what would the direction, where, where should we examine, where should we look for solutions? You don't actually have to say the solution, but sort of point in a general direction of where we might find some solutions. So this is kind of a five point test to see, did I cre create or frame a problem correctly, problem statement correctly? And that's a little bit of a busy slide, but let me give you a really specific example. The X Prize is a nonprofit organization. It was uh, founded by, I think, Peter Diamandis. This is a $10 million prize. And this had to do with what technology, this is the problem statement. It's a very short sentence. The problem statement is what technology can convert the most CO2 that's in the atmosphere in a way that is usable with products that have the highest net value. And what I'm showing you in this little table here is this is a, this is taking this statement and let's make this a problem statement. First off, well, what is the context? So the first thing we're talking about is we're dealing with the atmosphere, CO2 in the atmosphere. It has been rising for decades. By the way, I'm not getting into any politics around you know who's causing that. I'm just saying factually, CO2 has been rising historically going back about 800,000 years. That's the context. Now, the current situation is the CO2 level is at 414 uh, parts per million, and it continues to rise at a very rapid rate. That's the current situation. Okay, well, who cares? Well, the who cares is the impact. The, the impact of this climate change because of higher levels of CO2 is it's causing a lot more intense uh, climate events like heat waves and fires and hurricanes, snowstorms, droughts, all those things that we're beginning to see a lot more in the news, for example. That is the impact of having higher CO2. It also affects humans and animals and plants. So, you know, it really has a very big impact. Now, what would be the ideal state? Maybe it's not possible, but wouldn't it be great if we could wind the clock back to 1950 when, I'm not saying in terms of people and technology, but I'm saying in terms of the atmosphere, if the air could be kind of like back in the 1950 with regards to CO2, we had other pollutants at that time, but at least with CO2 in the atmosphere, it was around 310 parts per million. So that would be ideal. Could we take the CO2 and get it back? And now what would be potential solutions? Well, what could we do to remove carbon from the atmosphere? What can we do to sequester it maybe into um, consumer goods and ideal materials, et cetera? We don't get into the exact solution, but we're just sort of pointing to areas where we might make an impact. All right, so now here's the solution. The winner, I told you it was a $10 million prize on how can we reduce carbon in the atmosphere. And there are a number of winners, but this is the one I thought I'd just show you for, for a second. Very creative. You can see here, it's an organization called Captura. It is part of Caltech. Caltech is the university, of course. And what you see here is a, is a concept. It's a $10 million prize to actually develop this concept. And it's extracting carbon uh, CO2 from the ocean. The ocean is the number one absorber of atmospheric CO2. And what you see here is this device that will use electrolysis and pull CO2 out of the atmosphere and then become useful in products. So that's an example of the winner that came from this problem statement framework, okay? So once again, tip is really think through this problem statement. What is the context in which this problem resides? Describe the current situation briefly. What would be the impact if we could solve this? or didn't solve this? What is, how is this affecting um, the world? What would the ideal state be like? And then some general direction where we could look for some solutions. So that's number one, tip number one. Number two, let's move to the second one, root cause analysis. In engineering, a lot of times we're dealing with a problem and we have to figure out, well, what is the root cause? What's causing this situation to exist that's a problem? Now, today I'm talking about the word problem, but it, you could replace the word problem with opportunity. For the purpose of today's discussion, we're talking about problem solving when it's a issue, something we're trying to deal with. So this root cause analysis definition is just, it's the, the highest level cause that precipitates or sets in motion a whole chain of cause and effect reactions. So it is the original source or trigger 
from, for some set of problems. Maybe it's like a domino effect. Hey, this one thing causes this um, domino effect or you know, rippling downstream of other problems. So what is the original trigger for the set of issues that are going on? That's what root cause analysis is all about. Okay, here's a, here's a specific example. It's a little bit of a busy slide, but you may remember back in 2017 or so, Equifax, which is a major uh, credit card company, was hacked and it was a big deal. 143 million consumers, personal information was put out into the wild. It was, it was uh, made available publicly from this hacker. Okay, so what happened? What is the root cause analysis? Well, we know the problem <laughs> is 143 million consumers. By the way, I'm one of them. I remember when we got uh, our, our statement or letter from Equifax saying, you've been hacked, we're doing our best to resolve it. So the problem was 143 million consumers, personal information, not credit card information, but other personal information was revealed. And with this, um, there's a security company that was hired to do some forensics, to really dig into what happened and they work backwards and say, okay, well, it looks like their first step was the hacker went to the website and tried to hack the website. And then when they did, they found that there was a vulnerability in the dispute resolutions part of the website. So let's suppose I have a credit card and I have a dispute. I would go to this dispute site within the website and that server had some holes in it. So the root cause is well, now we go back from the dispute server to the database that was used for personal information. That's this step number three you can see here. That database was compromised or credentials were extracted from that. And you can see step number four, this had happened over a period of about 76 days. It didn't happen all overnight. This database was slowly eroded away, personal information taken out uh, day in, day out over 76 days and ultimately extracted 143 million consumers' personal information. So the point here in this whole root cause analysis is it's not a it's not enough to say, oh, the website was hacked. Well, okay, it was hacked, but where where inside the website was it hacked? And it goes all the way back to this database uh, dispute resolutions server and going back to the database where all the PII, personally identifiable information, was held. So this is an example of where you take time, like the time from the hacking, and you work backwards say, all right, well then what was the original source of this problem, okay? Now, this is audience participation, guys. Everyone, if you would, please, I have a real specific situation. I'd love to have you throw out some ideas. So in the lower right of your screen, you should see chat with everyone in the studio, right? And what I'd like you to do is imagine a laptop getting hot. Your laptop is starting to get hot. You notice, well, what could be the root cause of your machine getting hot and warmer? And so I'd love you to just put them in the chat box here. Okay, you can just uh, put that in the... Okay, Jonathan, uh, help me for a second. I see private chat, but I want to be able to see everyone's chat. Okay, I think people are just typing in some notes. I see there. We'll give it, uh, we'll, we'll give it about um, a few... 10 seconds uh just because there is a slight delay between uh yeah, the stream and but uh, we are receiving comments right now actually yeah, so i'll just you. put them yeah. on the screen right now perfect jonathan thank you yeah tyro running too long applications are overloading the processor uh high computation absolutely dust clogging the air in inlet for sure software bug with monitoring ventilation issues oh gosh putting a laptop on a pillow bad idea yes yeah, and people are pointing out A, option A, B, C. And by the way, there's not one right answer. What I'm trying to get you to think about is, well, what could be causing this? What could be causing blocking the air inlet? Absolutely. The fan, sure. If the fan has failed, absolutely, that could be a root cause. Bad computer design. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, sure. I've seen that happen. Uh, so all of the above. You know, you're right. All of the above. Any one of these could be... And again, as I said, there's not one right answer specifically, but what I'm trying to get you to see here is um, there's a question you might ask, which is how quickly, how long has this problem been going on, this laptop heating up? How long? Did it just suddenly start happening? Or is over time, have you noticed your laptop is getting hotter and hotter and hotter? Uh, because if it was something that happened over, you know, overnight, now suddenly all my laptop is getting hot, well, there's probably something that just failed. So maybe the fan just failed. If it's something that's been gradually happening over time, that might be more like dust clogging or it might be the, the 
thermal paste, which apparently is the heat sink uh, paste, or it might be the battery degrading. A lot of these issues that you're bringing up, the ventilation may, could have been off. So the thing to look at, when you look at root cause analysis, you want to look at time. Is it something that happened just now? Has it been happening over a period of time? And then kind of can look at that. Yeah, Stuxnet, interesting, Peter. That's a good observation. Root, root cause could be something like that as a hack. Okay, let's move on to the next slide, but you get the idea. And the point in this root cause analysis is identify, identify the sequence of events. And it was kind of a trick question, guys, on that last one, the laptop getting hot. All of those answers are very valid. And the ones you put in the chat were also, also valid. Someone else mentioned processor failing. Many things could have gone wrong. The thing to maybe consider is what was the trigger or how long has this been happening? And look back to the first moment um, in time that this could have this problem could have arisen. All right, let's move to number three, abstraction. Number three of eight. We have eight of them. This next idea is to abstract or to model a lot of engineering problems that actually already been solved. So you may be facing a situation where, you know, hey, I have this unique situation. Well, maybe step back for a second and say, well, perhaps this has already been modeled. Perhaps someone has already figured out uh, a way to predict this behavior in a different context. So let's take a look at it. This is, a, this is a question I have to ask all of you in the chat box if you'd like to put something in here. I know there's a little momentary delay. On the left image, you'll see a galaxy, a galaxy um, cluster actually, it looks like maybe two galaxies. Uh, it's, it's about a billion stars. It's a bunch of stars together. And on the right is a Wall Street index. And you can see over the course of the year, it's been jumping up and down. What do you think might be a something that's in common between the two? A star, a star system way out there, right? A galaxy and then Wall Street data. I'll give you a second to think about what is common among these things. Yes, applied uh, app math fizz. Both rely on lots and lots of data. Large amount of noise. Robert Williams, excellent. That's correct. Tons of noise, tons of data. Observational science, very good. Both of them have to do with observations, actual data points. Yeah, very good. Uh, noise. Uh, random. There's a lot of random elements. Noise and random are often um, you know, synonymous. Observational science, correct. Both of them are observational. So uh, models can apply to both. A model, believe it or not, that's used in astronomy can also be used. The model could also be used for Wall Street. What's interesting, a lot of physics PhDs by the way, don't end up going off and teaching and becoming physics professors or math professors or astronomy physics, astrophysics professors. Uh, Wall Street attracts them. And why is that? Well, it's because similar problem of we have massive amounts of data and what is the pattern that's hidden in the data and how do you extract the noise, uh, ex the signal from the noise, things like that. Lots of cool comments. Here's another situation, guys. This is a route. So I live here in Silicon Valley near San Francisco. And this is a route. Let's suppose I'm in San Jose and I want to get to San Francisco. What is the best route? One option is to go up the peninsula on the left here, and that's going to take you know, a certain amount of time. And then on the right, I could go the other way, and that's an hour and nine minutes. But there's multiple myriad ways to get from San Jose to San Francisco. That is a route optimization model. And this, this kind of an abstraction is very common. There are a lot of problems that... Uh, that are really root optimization problems. So let's, here's another situation. You've got coffee on the left and on the right, a coffee uh, website, it's called Trade. And you can have all kinds of different kinds of coffee on the left. On the right, you have uh, vacation rentals, okay, in Hawaii. What do these two things have in common? In both cases, the website is, is making recommendations based on your particular interests. So I'm an avid coffee drinker. I will put in there the profile, the kind of coffee I like. I like it strong. I like it certain properties on the right. Similarly, I might be looking for a Hawaii vacation, and I, I may have a certain number of bedrooms and distance from the ocean, blah, blah, blah. In both cases, at the end of the day, it's a recommendation engine based on a set of criteria, based on some user behavior and preferences. So that's an example of a recommendation engine. So abstraction, what we are doing in both examples, the Wall Street slash astrophysics example or the recommendation engine or the root optimization, all of these are about abstracting and thinking about what is the generalized problem. So the first step is to generalize. So this is not about Wall Street 
uh, stock performance, or it's not about a hotel, I'm seeing Airbnb selection. It really is about a broader problem, like a recommendation engine or a mathematical model. So that second thing is to create a model, and this model ideally needs to be effective in predicting future behavior. So the model has to be tested and used against real world data. Going back to the astronomy example and the Wall Street example, people develop models all the time, but they may not be as good in predicting the behavior of these moving planets and star systems or moving stock, um, stock quotes. So therefore you have to test and tune this, this model to make sure that it's working really well. And yes, to folks asking the question, start, I think the presentations are available, Jonathan, afterwards, absolutely. Forgive me in advance if I don't answer people's questions as we go. I think we have, I know we had some time towards the end to make sure I address any other open items. Okay, we're on number three of eight. So here is, if uh, tip number three is also abstraction, it's related to what we just talked about. It's more of a, this is a summary, sorry, of number three, what we just covered, to look for a generalized problem and create a model and then test this model against the reality and see if you can iterate. So that was number three of eight. Number four, let's move to number four of eight, uh, analogy. There are lots and lots of examples of engineering problems that have been solved in a completely different context. So let's suppose I'm in the semiconductor industry. Well, a problem may have been solved in, in genetics. It may have been solved in the botany world. It could have been solved again in astronomy. Who knows? Completely different discipline. So what we're looking for here is analogies. So I have a particular problem area. Um, but is there an analogy, a similar kind of situation in a very different context? And we can look for some clues. Here is an example of an analogy that could come in. On the top, top left, this is a printed circuit board. And then you've got this laser, and the laser needs to move around and in the most efficient way possible, zap a hole through the printed circuit board in order to put the chips underneath it. So you want to be efficient in the movement of the laser head, right? You don't want to be zooming around all over the place. You want to be very smart and optimize the route. Sounding familiar? And then on the upper right, it, here's a UPS or any delivery company. They don't roam around the city. They're very smart in, in the delivery. They have a certain route that is the most efficient, the lowest number of miles to achieve the maximum number of deliveries in the home, okay? And then the bottom example is actually genetics. It's gene sequencing. All three of these remarkably are optimization problems, is how do you optimize a route and do this in a very smart sort of way? It's called the traveling salesman problem. So if I'm a salesman and my territory is the entire, let's say, the northeast of the United States, what is the efficient, most efficient way for me to get in my car and cover as many cities as possible without having to backtrack, double track? you know, and save as much fuel as possible. That's a very common problem. It's called the traveling salesman. That's an analogy. Here's another analogy. This is it's from the animal kingdom. See the picture on the left? That's a, that's a microscope examination of shark skin. This is the, the top layer of a shark, which is very smooth, by the way. It's smooth as silk. And you can see it has these little plates with sharp points to it. That exact design, because it's super smooth, water flows very smoothly over a shark, and this allows the shark to be stealth, to move smoothly and quickly through the water. And guess what? Airplanes, giant jumbo jets, they need the same property. How do they have a smooth exterior that minimizes drag through the atmosphere as it's flying, you know, 500, 600, 500 plus miles an hour? You want to minimize drag and you want a very smooth, laminar flow over over the aircraft surface and so what the designer did here this is an example of Lufthansa and I don't know I think it's Boeing it's either Boeing or Airbus I can't quite tell from the slide one of the manufacturers looked for the animal kingdom again totally different context we're not even talking about aerospace aerodynamics we're talking about animals in the wild in nature that have a very streamlined low profile they have a credible uh, low drag ratio, for example, and show shark skin was, was a perfect example. So in this tip, um, what I would recommend you might want to do is, again, step back from the problem at hand and look to some other totally different discipline. Thank you, Henry Rolf. I appreciate that, Henry. Uh, it is Airbus 380. Thank you for, for pulling that out. So look to nature. Is there a similar problem going on in the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, the insect kingdom? By the way, typo, sorry, it should be insects. 
um, has this problem been solved in medicine, astrophysics, biochemistry, genetics? And so what really helps is, of course, we, we are, we're engineers. We can't be experts in every field. What you can do is share your problem statement with friends, family, colleagues, and see, think, think out of the box. Like what, what could be a potential problem that has been solved in a completely different context? Okay, so that's analogy number four tip. So as I said, before you dive into a problem in your engineering, step back and see if there's an analogy in a different field. That's number four. All right, let's move to number five. Now, the day before, and this is brainstorming, as part of problem solving, how do we engage more brains? And brainstorming is a team activity. It's a group activity. And so this is a perfect example. Peter, Peter Diamandis, he's the entrepreneur who did the X Prize, for example. And there are other people. Larry Page later came on and added some more money. The idea of brainstorming, the whole point of brainstorming is it's called divergent thinking. You want to get as many ideas as possible. The crazier, the better. I love his comment here. It says the day before there is something that's truly a breakthrough, it's usually some crazy idea. Okay, crazy idea. In brainstorming, um, everything is fair. We're not trying to judge ideas. Again, it's called divergent thinking. I wrote a different ebook around this, different kinds of thinking. Later on, we'll get to convergent thinking, which is getting to consensus and picking the best solution to a problem. At this stage, we're just brainstorming crazy ideas. The more, the better. And as I said, this is divergent. So divergent means going out, you know, expanding. You want more ideas are better than fewer. So you want to, if you're doing a brainstorm session with your colleagues, uh, teammates, you want to invite as many ideas as possible. Don't judge them, critique them, evaluate them, uh, make any comments, just like the more the merrier, the crazier the better. Because there will be a time later to then say, all right, now let's use some criteria and do some conversion thinking. All right, so uh, here's an example. And brainstorming, by the way, can be, it's not just your team activity. You can crowdsource. You can put this out into the market. Samsung did an awesome job just a few years ago. They put out a contest to say, we want flexible displays. Wouldn't that be cool to have a flexible display? And they put out a competition, $10,000, just for some ideas on how we might develop a Samsung uh, portable phone, let's say, uh, or possibly a laptop or a uh, display pad that has a flexible screen. And so they put this out, crowdsourced a bunch of ideas. Ultimately, they got some ideas back and then they narrowed it down. That's again, divergent thinking. They put it out to the crowd, crowd meaning the internet. Tons and tons of ideas, many of which were vetted and ultimately they came down to this bendable screen um, invention here, you can see, which is patented. So it's a fantastic idea, throw out the brainstorming to as many people as possible, okay? So now before you do brainstorm, again, we have to make sure we have a very clear problem statement. You want to bound the brainstorming to a particular topic. The example of Samsung is Samsung is we would like a bendable display. And they said what kind of display? It's for consumer uh, I, uh, cell phones, for you know display devices, things like that. Uh, they didn't say it's for everything. They just said specifically for computers and phones. And then, as we said earlier, you want to go for quantity as many. We're not going for quality. We're going for quantity, maximum number of ideas. Uh, we can suspend judgment and have fun with the process. Brainstorming can be incredibly silly. It is often sort of right brain thinking. It's creative. It's expansive. It's expressive. It's fun. And you just want to get people's creative juices. And it's also good to do this over time. By the way, it doesn't have to be one real time session. You can do brainstorm asynchronously. Uh, in my team, executive leadership team here at Aventi Group, we use the Miro board, Miro, M-I-R-O board, and we'll put in there a brainstorm session. We'll leave it open for a couple of weeks for ideas, for people to put in ideas. So asynchronous, you know, the X Prize that I mentioned, the Samsung Prize, all of those are asynchronous brainstorm ideas to allow the market to come up with some ideas. Then we can apply some conversion thinking, which says, all right, let's have some criteria. Like, how do we pick the best idea? Well, is it affordable? Is it doable? Is it efficient? Is it effective? Those sort of things. And then you can pick uh, the specific one and also reliability. There's some factors you can come up with to, to pick out the best options. You can prioritize and then pick out the best. So that would be brainstorming. So the tip here is that 
You know, two or more brains are always better than one in this case because it's divergent thinking. We want more. And then uh, this idea of narrowing choices is convergent thinking, which we can do later. And out of this convergent thinking and uh, divergent thinking, you can you may have a breakthrough idea that comes up. Now, with regards to misinformation, I appreciate that, David. Uh, brainstorming is, remember, we're suspending judgment, we're suspending reality, it's just ideas, we're throwing out, you know, comments and questions and ideas in a brainstorm phase. When it gets to convergent thinking, that's where we can apply some filters like, hey, is this based on facts, on evidence, on data, on provable hypotheses? You know, you can apply it, convergent thinking is where you can uh, battle misinformation. Okay, I hope that answers your question, David. All right, trial and error. Let's move to the next principle in problem solving. A lot of engineering is really, really good trial and error. Like, well, we think this works. Let's just give it a try. Give it a try. See if it works. And if it does, great. If it doesn't, we'll try it again. So I really like this definition from the e-learning Toronto. It says trial and error involves continuously testing possible solutions until you achieve the correct outcome. Now, it's not always practical. Practical. It, it only works in certain cases. Here is a legendary example of uh, trial and error, right? Thomas Edison apparently went through 6,000 <laughs> vegetable growth. I was kind of surprised to read this, like why vegetable growth? I would have picked metals, but uh, he also looked at metals, but surprisingly 6,000 different kinds of <laughs> vegetable growths when he was looking at filaments in a light bulb. What filament would last the longest? Because a lot of them would burn out too quickly. Ultimately, things like tungsten turn out to be uh, very effective for incandescent light bulbs. But guess what? It was not some big mathematical model. It wasn't a lot of, you know, so-called root, root cause analysis, things we've talked about earlier. It was just plain old trial and error. He, if you ever go to the museum, I think it's in Detroit, they have a model of the Thomas Edison uh, workshop. And in, in, I highly encourage you to go. It's called the Henry Ford Museum. It's in Detroit. Fantastic museum. They actually have Thomas Edison's replicated lab where he developed all these filaments and you'll see this room shelves filled with these different filament um, test filament uh, items and he went through them sequentially to see which ones work and he took a lot of notes in the software field of course integrated development environment you all know this many of you who are software engineers sometimes you just have to compile build and execute and see if your program works if it doesn't you go back to debugging and figuring out well where did i go wrong highly iterative it's kind of a pain but in software quality, uh, sometimes it is just plain trial and error. It's not formulaic necessarily. And um, it, it, it is, it's maybe not the most efficient, but as long as each trial, each trial is relatively simple, you can do them very rapidly. You can go through lots of trials. So here's another example. Sometimes it takes decades. It, ta it can take decades to perfect something. What is the perfect airplane wing? Is it thick? Is it thin? Is it elliptical? Is it square? Is it straight? Is it cranked? I mean, so far, it turns out that that's not a simple problem. Yes, you can have wind tunnels. You can you can model these things, um, and then that helps. But if you look at the history of airplanes, it, it has taken decades to evolve over time. And obviously, there's different kinds of aircraft. You you've got a stealth a stealth aircraft that is going to be very different from one carrying 500 passengers. You know, they have different requirements. Um, but trial and error turns out to be, in addition to modeling, of course, you have lots of very sophisticated modeling that goes on, uh, but trial and error has actually resulted in some improvements in, in, in the airfoil design. So lessons around um, trial and error. Well, it, it, it is only appropriate to use trial and error if you can test rapidly and cost effectively. It, like an airplane, it, it's super expensive to sit here and create an airplane go build it and see if it works. So instead, that's why it's taking decades and lots of over time, you can see what works. Something like software development, you'll know very quickly if you compile and run and it doesn't work, it blows up, then you can do that very quickly. So you may wanna use trial and error where modeling is hard. It's hard to model if the software is gonna work or not, or it's hard to model if an airplane is gonna work or not. Yes, you can model, you certainly can. I'm not saying don't model, but if modeling is difficult, and if the cost of failure is low, right? If, if I do something and it doesn't work, like the Thomas Edison example, the filament, you know, if it burns out, it's not a big deal, right? Just go get a different filament. So in airplanes, obviously the cost of failure is huge, which is why you wanna make sure that that wing works 
and you're only testing efficiency out in the market uh, in, in the real world. Um, so successful trials also should be very repeatable at scale, Re at scale, meaning, you know, in large numbers, you should be able to do this quickly and, and efficiently. Let's move to the next one. Uh, the next tip for problem solving is divide and conquer. You know, a lot of problems can actually be broken down into smaller problems that can be solved. Parallel computing is a great example where one big problem is broken down into some chunks and then you can efficiently and in parallel solve problems. Uh, here's a specific example. You might have seen this in, um, in computation where let's say you have a string of numbers here from left to right at the very top, you know, 38, 27. And how do you sort this quickly from, from the smallest number to the largest number? Well, one way to break the problem down, I'm not saying it's the only way, it's one way, is to take the, the numbers at the very top and break it into a group one with four, one with three, and then split that. And then you're doing a comparison, which number is bigger? 38 is bigger than 27, 43 is bigger than three, et cetera. Um, or, or you do a comparison, right? 38 is bigger than 27, 43 is bigger than three, nine is smaller than 82 and so forth. And then you recombine going backwards. So this, in a few steps, you can quickly sort a number, a sequence of numbers that are sort of random like this. You can see, sequence them without having to take each number and compare against all the remaining numbers. That's sort of a very manual method. That's very cumbersome and long. This is a quick way to break this down into chunks. And then each chunk is broken further down and then reassembled. That's the whole idea behind divide and conquer. So the principle is to break down a problem. If you can, break it down into chunks that are easier to solve and can even be solved in parallel. This is the key, in parallel. If, you, if you're breaking it down into chunks and then they become serial, then you're not really saving a ton of time. Ideally, you break it down into tasks that can be done in parallel and then regroup. And this allows for some um, ideally repetitive calculations that are done in parallel. So you can save a lot of time, a lot, of, a lot more efficient, fewer steps to achieve an objective. All right, guys, we're almost done and we can open up to computation, uh, open up to questions. Uh, next area is lateral thinking. This is this whole idea of sort of out of the box thinking, nonlinear thinking, creative approaches to engineering. Instead of just going step by step by step, how do we think in a different way? You know, it's called lateral thinking, it's a, sort of a psychological term. Uh, I like to use this example. This is Edith Clark. She was an engineer. Um, this is a long time ago. I think it was in the early 1900s. And the problem at that time is, is power distribution. You used to have a limit in the cables. These are power cables. These are big, high-voltage power lines. You can imagine uh, those, those power lines above the house, not the ones in the ground, although certainly it could be in the ground or above, but those big, fat cables that, that convey power. There used to be a belief, uh, an actual engineering limit of, you know, we can only go about 50 miles. That means you had to have a power generation no more than 50 miles away from the city. It, power generation had to be pretty close. So that was a real problem. It's like, ideally, we have power that's further away and you can go farther for electricity. I'm talking about electricity power, by the way. Well, she, um, she ran some interesting math. She came up with this idea of a calculator and she uh, was able to crack this limit, this 50 mile limit through some very smart mathematical modeling of how power can go down a conduit. And she found that it does not have to be limited by 50 miles. Now it's more like several hundred miles. And that made it possible for power generation, electricity generation to be done far away from the big cities. And that also leads to some big efficiencies. So that was out of the box thinking because at that time, nobody thought we could get over 50 mile limit for cable. What she did, what Edith Clark did that was very unique. And I'm not saying she's the only one who did this, but it was fantastic is she asked why. Why do we have this 50 mile limit? What, what's causing us to not be able to have electricity in power transmit a lot much, much farther than 50 miles? Why is this a problem? Why? And she kept asking, well, what, what's causing that limit? Well, let me, what's causing that limit? And so she kept asking why multiple, uh, in multiple iterations to get to the bottom of what's going on. And she had come up with this interesting mathematical model that remove some of these uh, constraints that were applied in, in, in all other engineers' minds. And sometimes random association can be a really great way to do uh, lateral thinking. That means 
you pair up like an engineering problem with something that has nothing to do with engineering. It could be a different field. Like that example I gave earlier about the shark skin and the Airbus airplane. You know, the problem is you want this airplane to be very efficient, fly, fly through the atmosphere with minimal drag. What kind of paint, what kind of surface would be great? The lateral thinking is, well, how did this get solved in the animal kingdom? Because certain animals need to be very streamlined and smooth and fast. How do they solve this problem? So that's a perfect example of lateral thinking. Contrarian thinking might be just asking, well, why not? Why? Why not? Uh, John F. Kennedy, famous statement, you know, I, some people... I, I know I'm going to blow this quote, but some people ask why, uh, why I ask why not, right? And forgive me, someone in the chat can probably correct me on, was that Robert Kennedy or John F. Kennedy? Some people ask what is possible, I ask why not? So that's contrarian thinking. Okay, number eight, this is our last one, then we'll open it up. Um, and this is the summary here, is, is engineering problems can be solved by looking at not just linear, but more non-linear, out-of-the-box ideas and thinking. RFK, thank you, JD, GDS, thank you, RFK. I'd love it if someone could put the actual quote in there. <laughs> I know I butchered it. Uh, but what RFK, Robert F. Kennedy did is he just said, why not? He was challenging the thinking at the time. And that's what lateral thinking is all about. Why not? Why not do this? And it gets people's minds thinking expansively, thinking into other domains and, and questioning long-held assumptions. That's the whole point of, of lateral thinking, okay? So let me just recap here. Again, we'll open it up to questions at this point. Uh, what I hope I did is give you a taste of eight very different ways to think about problem solving, solving a specific problem. We start with the, what is the problem statement? Again, spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem before you jump to a solution. We as engineers are almost wired. I know I'm very wired to jump to solution mode when it's helpful to just pause and think about the problem in different ways. Uh, thank you, GDS is putting in some men see things as they are and say why. I dream of things that never were and say why not. Thank you, GDS. I appreciate that. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Yeah, so that is an example of lateral thinking, number eight. Root cause analysis, we talked about that earlier. So the key there is going back in time, looking at the time sequence of an issue and finding out what, what happened when. Another example of root cause analysis, I've talked about this in other, uh, the, the, the tragic Challenger shuttle accident. Ultimately, the root cause of that was O-rings that had failed in the cold Florida atmosphere, you know, the cold Florida weather caused the O-rings to fail. They were not malleable and sealing the, o, the O's. Instead, they were brittle and um, they, they failed. And that was a time series analysis. Well, what led to what led to what ultimately traced all the way back to these O-rings. Feynman, Richard Feynman, famous uh, physicist, is the one who was on that investigation. And he helped with, with a group of engineers. They all figured out that the core issue was O-ring failure in the Challenger accident. So that's root cause analysis. And you'll see this every single day in, in cybersecurity hacks. You'll see this in you know, other accidents. You know, what is it that caused this problem? Abstraction we talked about is like step way back. And could we create a model to model this situation that's going on? Maybe it's been solved in an analogy in the animal kingdom, plant kingdom, a different science discipline. We talked about brainstorming, which is diverse thinking, uh, divergent thinking, getting as many ideas on the table as possible. And then, of course, use critical thinking to pare it down or convergent thinking to get it down to the best idea. Trial and error, we talked about. If the cost of failure is very small and you can do it very quickly and cost effectively, trial and error is a very meaningful way to, to get stuff done. Um, we talked about divide and conquer, and that's taking a problem, breaking it down into solvable chunks that could ideally be done in parallel. All right. And then the last item is lateral thinking, which we just covered a moment ago, which is thinking expansively out of the normal field. And, and really examining uh, issues. Okay, Jonathan, I'm going to open up to questions here. I hope somebody, you, you all got at least one or two or three ideas to take home. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sarita. Sure. Really great presentation. Thank you. Um, so I guess before we go, while we're still waiting on uh, audience questions um, and folks, uh, uh, since we are at the Q&A portion of the presentation, please send your comments and questions into the live chat or uh, comments uh section in your respective live streams 
and we'll get to them as soon as we can. So Sarita, mm -hmm. um, a couple of questions of my own. Um, mm -hmm. You've talked a lot about how these problems, <clears throat> solving skills can uh, apply to, uh, for, for engineers and people in technical professions. Uh, you've given some examples as well. My question is, can these problem solving steps also apply to situations in the workplace, possibly, oh, yes. um, maybe or non-technical situations? Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Problem, if you look at the eight items we have shown on the screen here, first one is problem seeing. Let's suppose in a work situation, you've got a problem going on. Uh, maybe it's not getting along well with your manager, or maybe it's a colleague that's a problem, or something is going on organizationally. Well, step one might be, let's really define what is the problem here? What's going on? And what is the cause of this root cause analysis? You know, have I seen this situation happen somewhere else? I mean, you literally could use these same steps. In, in dealing with organizational behavior, people. <laughs> and people sometimes are the most nonlinear, you know, random things you can imagine. Uh, so I would say the short answer is absolutely apply these principles. They absolutely work. Trial and error, hey, that also works with human beings. You know, try something different if you're dealing with some problem at work. Maybe change it up. Whatever you have been doing, if that's not working, try something new and different. Fantastic, thank you. Mm -hmm. My next question is, um, so, for people, um, for for entry level, or I guess people just trying to get into the profession, or maybe even for established individuals as well, they're gonna. Uh, I'm sure they're going to be asked problem solving question uh, during a job interview. Mm -hmm. Can, do you have any uh, examples of questions that might be asked or are very commonly um, asked during uh, during job interviews for those kinds of roles for uh, technical roles? Yeah, one of the the one of the best ones is the five whys. You may be asked in an interview five whys. What does that mean? They may throw some problem at you and say, "Why is the sky blue?" I'm just going to make up something. It may be a very specific engineering. Why is the sky blue? And you might say, "Well, it's because of the scattering of of light as it hits oxygen in the upper atmosphere." Uh, blah blah blah. Well, why is that? And so, in an interview situation, you may be asked to dig deeper and go why, 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 uh, five times at five levels of why. So it's a good practice if you're talking to a software company and you're interviewing for a software engineering job, um, they may ask you uh, for ideas on solving a particular problem and then ask you, are there, you know, give me five other ways we could solve this problem. See, what they're trying to do is get you to think laterally and out of the box. They're looking for creativity. It's kind of surprising in engineering, one of the most valuable skills you can have in addition to critical thinking is creativity. And so with regards to problems you may be presented in an interview, a lot of times they're looking at how you think. Are you thinking linearly? Are you thinking divergently? Are you thinking laterally? Are you thinking with a step you know, methodology? Uh, there's not necessarily one right answer. It depends on what the hiring person is looking for. They may be looking for someone who's very linear, very methodical, very structured, or they may be looking for, again, more divergent thinking, more out of the box, you know, crazy ideas. So those are some things you may want to consider in your interviews, the five whys. Um, also, I would really encourage engineers to do more of this lateral thinking. I, I have a certain favoritism <laughs> towards that one. Because some of the best ideas, some of these unicorns, these billion-dollar companies come from asking why. Like, why are we doing this? Isn't there a better way? So in an interview, that's something helpful to bring up. I see. I see. Gotcha. Really great insight. Thank you. And I see that um, sure. there's a lot of discussion going on in our uh, YouTube live stream, uh, live chat as well. So really love the engagement, guys. Uh, keep it up. So one question from our audience member, Harvey asks, how do you know when to transition from defining the problem to solving the problem? Well, the Einstein example was 55 minutes, um, and then it lasts five minutes of solutions. I think longer than you normally would. I don't have a hard and fast rule to this, so it depends on how much time do you have. Let's suppose you have a week to come up with some proposed solutions well, let's, I'm just making some. Let's suppose you have budgeted a week to examine a problem and get moving on a solution. Maybe it's not a week. Maybe it's a day. Whatever the time budget is you have to come up with a solution, maybe allocate 80-20, right? If you have a week, maybe give yourself a few days to think about the problem from different angles before you get to solutions. Because you have time. The more you, you think about the problem statement, remember in the problem statement, we talked about specific things. What's the context? What is the, what's wrong with the current situation? What is the impact of that current situation? And then what might be possible solution areas to look at? 
So with regards to time budget, maybe 80-20 rule, give yourself more time than you normally would. And you know it, you will feel it. You, you may even see the temptation to jump to solutions. Maybe park that instinct for a little longer and give yourself time to reflect. And when I say reflect on the problem statement, I mean those things, context, current situation, ideal state. What would you ideally like to have the situation look like? And then the impacts, how do you want to mitigate? Got it, thank you. Harvey, thanks for sending in your question. Yes, Harvey, thank um, you. And and gonna highlight this uh, one uh, statement, not not so much a question, but a statement uh, from one of our um, viewers. I always try to come up with several solutions to every hard problem, then com compete them against each other as a bake-off, like that. Yes. So this next That's question, uh, Michael asks, if you've been given a budget to solve a problem, which of these techniques are the most cost efficient or how should they be prioritized to achieve a cost effective solution? Well, that's a hard one. If you've been given a budget to solve a problem, which techniques are most cost efficient and how should they be prioritized to achieve a cost effective solution? That one's hard for me to answer because it so depends on what field you're in. As an example, trial and error may not be cost effective because the cost of a trial is very high. Uh, trial and error may be a highly efficient and low budget option, right? We talked about, let's use the Thomas Edison example. I know it's kind of silly, but you know, it was really, he had, he literally went through, you know, thousands of these filaments and it took a lot of time, didn't cost a ton of money. In your example, if you have a specific budget, um, look at some of these options. Some of them are going to be more expensive, like brainstorming may be pretty quick and easy. Like if you can quickly brainstorm options in the first day or two, uh, then you can con do conversion thinking and then get to an answer. These are not, not exclusive too. There's no reason you can't do multiple of these, by the way. It's it's not to the exclu one. Ex you could do brainstorming and at the same time be thinking about analogies. And you can actually combine the two in your brainstorming session. You may want to pose where has this problem been solved before? Let's brainstorm disciplines, engineering disciplines, science disciplines, medicine, you know, biology, uh, animal kingdom. So again, I don't have a hard and fast answer to your question on if you have a specific time budget. I would just say, look at these different approaches. Some of them are more complex and difficult, like root cause analysis can take a lot of time. Um, and I know I gave this challenger accident uh, or the shuttle accident, there's actually a deeper root cause than the O-rings. I see some people commenting. It is true. It's a management failure. Like what caused the root, the O-rings to be ignored? There were engineers who were speaking up about it, right? There were engineers and some management ignored the warnings of some of the engineers. So the root cause actually goes further back than the O-rings. So to answer your question on budget, you may not have a ton of time to do root cause analysis because that could take more time, let's say. Whereas trial and error might be quick or brainstorming might be very quick to do so it really depends on your situation how much time you're able to allocate so i guess going uh going off that question we have a, a kind of similar or question from one of our viewers so david asks uh which to prioritize within a budget wouldn't the absolute first priority be to define the problem any thoughts about that yeah yes yeah to me that's that's this goes back to the very first step before you even try to solve the problem is spend time on the problem statement literally 80 20 rule i think be, to within a budget think about that problem statement that is priority number one that is the first order of business and remember solve problem statements has to meet the five point test have you articulated the context have you identified the current situation do you know what the impact is of that current situation okay, have you painted a picture of what the ideal looks like and then number five uh, what would it take what would be possible areas of exploration I totally agree with David. Step number one, highest priority thing, you really shouldn't even do number two through eight until you've defined problem statement. Literally two through eight are different approaches. Number one is critical, problem statement. Spend more time on that. This is one of the mistakes I see with engineering folks. Sometimes they leap to a solution and then they get beaten by a competitor who looked at the problem very differently and solved the problem with a different approach. Definitely. Thanks for that insight, David. And thank you, Sreether. Thanks, David. So I think that's it for our audience questions so far. So while we're still waiting for uh, more questions to be sent in, mm -hmm. I guess, uh, Sreether, I think our audience would definitely love to hear uh, like specific situations in your own career, line of uh, work if you've ever had uh, these, use these techniques to really help like 
really bring or All really the time. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of a specific. So I run a high technology marketing agency. So we're not writing software, writing code, <laughs> or building devices. Instead, we are uh, working on marketing of high tech products, which are very sophisticated and very complex. Uh, this is more business to business IT software. It's not consumer products, but these are like Adobe and SAP and Zendesk and uh, companies like that, Amazon Web Services. We have a lot of cybersecurity companies. And so sometimes we are brought in um, because in marketing, one of the things you really have to do is the problem statement. The, what is the problem a particular technology is trying to solve? So for example, in the cybersecurity world, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of companies, technology companies that are saying, well, we will help to minimize breaches, security breaches. We will help to uh, prevent hackers from breaking the systems and getting in. That's great. How's your problem? How's your solution different from others? So this problem statement is something we do a lot in marketing and it comes down to what's the pain point we're trying to solve? What is the pain or the problem we're trying to solve? Before we answer that, really clearly defining who's the problem for, why is this a problem? What is the impact of having it? And we do this a lot with high tech company executives uh, who are asking us to help them to really sharply define their problem. Uh, statements in all of their marketing and sales literature. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. So since we are running uh, close to the end, I guess I'd like to close it off um, with a, just hearing a little bit about since you since you are the author of uh, our very mm -hmm. very popular um, uh, IEEE USA ebook series, Critical Thinking Skills for Engineers, would definitely love to hear a little bit more about the series as a whole and what our audience might be able to. Um, any insight they might be able to glean from um, getting the books as well or checking them out as well. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, thank you, Jonathan. The whole uh, series of five eBooks are all about critical thinking, critical thinking, and it's for engineers, but you know what? It's uh, very popular for non-engineers as well. And what is critical thinking there? It, it is thinking rigorously about things. And there are several elements to this. So in the five ebook series, we cover different topics. Today, we're focusing on problem solving is, is an element of critical thinking. There's some other elements like creativity. In fact, I was touching a lot on today. If you listen carefully to today's talk, problem solving involves a lot of creativity mm -hmm. and thinking out of the box and really challenging the way things are today. So one of the ebooks is all about creativity. Another one's around communication. So if you're going to do critical thinking, you also have to be able to do this in a team context. How do you communicate? You know, for example, this problem statement we talked about today, that's getting everyone on the same page on what is the problem we agree to solve together as an engineering team, for example. So one of the ebooks is around communication. How do you clearly communicate, not just one-on-one -on -one with you and, and your manager or your peer, but as a group, how do you work together and communicate effectively? A lot of this is not just writing skills, but it's oral, verbal communications. So we talk about creativity, communications. We talk about problem solving. Um, those are some elements. The overall banner, is, Jonathan, is around critical thinking for engineers. And that's the overall theme. And each of these eBooks has very specific examples in. And I feature, you know, people you may not have ever heard of, but I tell little stories that, that make it fun and interesting. A lot of historical examples. I, I use a lot of women scientists and engineers who've done some breakthrough work. You know, and that's just a shout out for the amazing women engineers that are out there. Fantastic, thank you. And folks, um, you can access, or you can get access to these eBooks uh, by checking out our, um, our IEEE USA shop. We have uh, most of the books in uh, ebook form, but also most of them are, or all of the books in ebook form and most of them in audiobook uh, format. So um, I think we should eventually get all of them in the audiobook form as well. And they are free for IEEE members. So definitely check them out. Uh, really great feedback, a lot, just a lot of great insight. Um, but Sreether, we really appreciate having you with us today. And you. you know, providing our audience your insight into vital problem solving techniques, um, I think will be incredibly helpful for solving real world situations for, for, for any profession or just any person. So really loved having you back with us. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. And thank you, IEEE members, IEEE USA members. You're wonderful. You're the key to the world, making the world a better place. All the work you guys do every single day, solving problems, characterizing them and addressing them is, is the world needs more engineers. So uh, great. I wish you all a fantastic holiday coming up if you're not already uh, starting your vacation and holidays. 
Uh, all the best for to you, sure. Jonathan, and the IEEE team. Thank you so much. And thank you to our audience for tuning in as well and for your great questions. At, as mentioned in the beginning of the webinar, we will be sending a short survey to, as well as the links to Sreether's ebooks and a webinar series to all registrants after this event and would love your feedback uh, regarding this webinar as well. Please like and subscribe to our channels and check back daily on our social media for future live stream updates. Have a great day, everyone.